Hello guys and welcome to episode 38 of the Beat Your Backlog podcast, a podcast discussing things gamers like to put off, get to another day, and oh yes, we'll definitely beat later their backlog. I'm your host Adam and today we are in the Paldea region of Game Freak and Nintendo's latest core Pokemon game, Pokemon Scarlet. Pokemon Scarlet was released with its partner game Pokemon Violet back on the 18th of November 2022. The game released some conflicted reviews, with reviewers applauding the open when changes made to the game, but despising how poorly the game ran on Nintendo Switch. In her 2022 review, Rebecca Valentine from IGN stated, Every minute I was happily running around the grassy fields of Paldea, I was also actively cringing at a Pokemon stuck in the floor, wincing at some weird frame rate nonsense going on with a nearby wild Pokemon, or groaning at another bout of crippling lag. And Joe Westcott's review on SwitchPlayer.net, he confirms these feelings with There's so much more I could say about Pokemon Scarlet and Violet, as I find them to be such endlessly fascinating and frustrating experiences. I don't think there's a game I've played whose performance has irked me so much, yet I still consider it to be a worthy contender for Game of the Year. These opinions show why Pokemon Scarlet sits at a middling 72 critic score on Metacritic and a measly 3.5 user score there too. After its release, Game Freak did release a few patches to try and fix some of the performance issues. However, they accidentally added a save corrupting bug via one of the updates, which I think sums up the incompetence of Game Freak on this game and the performance and presentations of their previous Pokemon game, Pokemon Legends Arceus. When the game was released, I couldn't believe the state Game Freak had released it in and at the time decided I did not want to support their behaviour by buying the game. I had more or less forgotten about the game until about seven months later when I was in a book off in Tokyo and I saw it there uh, for 17 euros, uh, like a second hand price and thought, okay, for that price, I'll pick it up. Uh, and it was more sort of as a souvenir because it looks cool with the, the, the cover art being in Japanese. So it was more of like a memory of Japan rather than to actually play the game. And because of course, most people in, in the US and Europe will know that Pokemon games really rarely get uh, discounted that much. So I thought, okay, 17 euros, I can, I, can, I can live with that. So then we skip forward to about one month ago. So now we're in 2024. And I was looking for a new game to play that I could play with one hand because I'd actually injured my left hand jumping over a fence uh, about a month pre uh, earlier. And because I have just had a baby daughter, or I should say my wife has just had a baby daughter and a lot of her time is spent sleeping on my chest. So I usually have one hand on her, usually kind of patting her back or her bum. And the other one I have free for a kind of simple game to play that I can play with one hand. And because of its turn-based combat, I decided to finally give Pokemon Scarlet a go. And spoilers for the rest of the episode, I mostly agree with Joe Westcott's view that this game is both the best and worst Pokemon game I've ever played and that the experience playing it is, as Westcott says, an annoying balance of fascinating and frustrating. So without further ado, let's get into what makes Pokemon Scarlet so good, what makes it bad and what is downright ugly about it. So starting off with the good and to be completely fair with Pokemon Scarlet there are a lot of really good things about this game which is obviously the reason why I think it is the best Pokemon game we've ever had. So starting off is this game a Pokemon uh, Breath of the Wild game and firstly you could kind of maybe argue it is because from the very very start of the game you are allowed to go in any direction you want which is something I think Pokemon fans have really wanted in the series or thought they wanted in the series for years. And it's something that Game Freak has always kind of pushed back on. And I remember, I can't remember what year it was. It was before Sword and Shield came out. But I remember there was this um, this piece of art that came out that looks like Pokemon Breath of the Wild, where you had the trainer in the middle. It had the kind of the landscape very much like the Breath of the Wild when you first come out of the first kind of uh, tomb where Link awakens. And it had the Pokemon in the distance and everyone was like, oh my God, this is the game we want. And um, yeah, I think this is kind of what, Game Freak have gone for in this game, but I don't think it quite reaches the Pokemon Breath of the Wild experience players hoped it would be. Nevertheless, it does do a lot of things right and makes the future of Pokemon look promising. The world is designed in the same way as, as The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, uh, where there are a lot of ridges and a lot of peaks which make you want to climb them. And what happens when you climb them and get to the top is there is always something interesting looking off in the distance. 
It might be the new uh, glittery beam of light for a terror raid or a terrorized Pokemon. It, there might be a new and interesting biome, or it might even just be a Pokemon that you've not yet seen in the game. The game always makes you want to keep exploring every single inch of Paldea. And for me, this was completely the best part of the game. Um, each of the different biomes in Paldea feel varied and are interesting to be in. Uh, my personal favorites were the swampy area, where there is a new version of Quagsire called Smog Smogon, uh, where he spawns. And I also love the bamboo forest area, where there are also these kind of like almost like termite hill peaks surrounded by like a... a um, um, yeah, like a bamboo forest where there are lots of cyber that spawn in Bisharp. And yeah, there are many, many other unique biomes in Paldea that really feel varied and alive. And the best thing about it is, is that you, you really want to go into and look into these areas because you're always rewarded for exploring. And like we like I said, I think the design of the world, uh, because it is so mountainous, um, it, it kind of creates this, this organic need to explore because uh, as we'll get onto a little bit your your legendary pokemon coridon you can ride them and as you level it up yeah you, you you can get to the top of these big mountains and you can always see something ahead of you what you want to go to next and what's cool is is that the game kind of further rewards the player for going there because the world is absolutely littered with items and it kind of reminded me of like the coins in a 3d mario game or specifically super mario odyssey where it might be that you see like a ledge above you where you think huh i wonder if i can jump up to that and it might be that doing a, like a really complicated set of jumps you can get up to that ledge but there's actually nothing there there's no star up there or, or i guess it was moon right in odyssey there's not, nothing of consequence up there, but the game always gave you at least some coins to be like, cool, you made it up here, well done, here is something for, for playing the game. And I feel like um, that's exactly what Pokemon Scarlet does too. It's basically like, uh, like I said, the, the more that you update Crydon, the more you can traverse the world and the more strange ledges or caves or whatever ocean uh, just rocks out in the ocean, the more of these things you can get to. And there might not be anything there, sometimes there is, but there is always usually a, a little sparkle on the ground that, that indicates there is an item there. Or there's usually a Pokeball that also indicates there's an item there. I thought it was great that the game rewarded you for your, for your curiosity. But of course, this comes kind of comes with a downside of if you do do a lot of exploring in the game, getting this many items can make the game a little bit easy. So at one point in the game, I had over 30 Hyper Potions and none of them I actually bought myself. They were all potions that I found just exploring in the game. And in fact, I think throughout the entire 50 hour playthrough of the game, I never actually had to buy any healing items at all because I found so many in the world exploring. And arguably, I guess you could say you do not have to pick them up as a player. If, if I'm kind of feeling like the game is giving me too much, you don't have to pick them up. But there was something very satisfying about running past them and just tapping A to grab them as you continue. It didn't slow the game down. It just felt very good to just be like, all right, I'm just going to, I'm kind of going this direction in a straight line, but I will zigzag a little bit just to pick up the items just because it was fun to, to, to traverse the world. So yeah, I can't really complain too much. And I also think the drive uh, to explore is heightened by the feeling of freedom the game gives you. And it feels just so refreshing to be able to go wherever you want. And the movement on Coridon or M M Miraidon, I think it's called, in Violet, it just feels great, especially when you fully update, uh, upgrade them, which we'll talk a little bit more when we get onto the story. The cherry on top of the world design is the 32 mysterious black stakes hidden around the map. Uh, there are four colours, therefore eight stakes for each colour. And if you manage to find all eight stakes of the same colour, it will unlock a secret shrine where one of the four legendary Pokemon dwells. And uh, at the time of recording, I found 16 of the stakes, so I've got two of the legendary Pokemon. And uh, yeah, I just think this is something cool, again, in the world to, to keep players invested in exploring. Uh, because, you know, the first one you see, you're kind of like, oh, I wonder what this, this is. And then it kind of, as you find more and more around the world, you realize, ah, okay, there is something to this. If I find all of these, something will happen. And yeah, it's also cool if you actually find the door to the shrine because it looks very cool. Again, very kind of Zelda-like in its kind of futuristic yet um, past or old or ancient sort of pattern on the door. And um, yeah, I think it's just great that the, the game gives you these. There's also the, I think they're called the Glimmy Ghouls dotted around the world so these the there are these little mini pokemon that are kind of coin and metal themed and they're just scattered around the world uh, all over the place like there are some that are hiding in chests and if you beat them you get quite a lot of coins you get 50 and there are some that maybe are just on um like notable places around the world like on rocks on signposts at the top of lighthouses things like that and it's quite cool because you just go around and again kind of uh collecting them and after a while you sort of wonder well what is this actually for 
And eventually you find out, ah, well, if I collect 999 of these coins, I, the, if I catch one of these glimmy ghouls in the chests, then they will evolve into this next next uh, evolution, which is also kind of cool, like a cool way to keep players invested in the in the world, um, in the game. And I think, yeah, it also is like a, a really big compliment I can give to Pokemon Scarlet is that, yeah, even after finishing the story, I still wanted to go back and play it uh, because there was so much still to to do. There was the legendaries to find. There is um, actually the other Pokemon. And I do actually plan for the for the first time in a very long time to actually catch them all and complete the Paladin Pokedex. And yeah, like I said, it's something that I've never I've not wanted to do in previous Pokemon games, but something that I'm, I'm really am willing to do in this game because it is so such a fun game and, and just feels so great to to be in and uh, yeah that kind of brings us on to the no next topic because uh, yeah alongside the exploration the game makes catching pokemon really really fun um the variety of different pokemon types uh, uh early on in the game made catching them really addictive for me because uh, the problem i always have with pokemon games is i always feel like the very early games are very very slow there's usually a lot of story and then when you actually get out into the world, it's always very similar. Of like, okay, you choose one of your three starter Pokemon. They're always fire, water, or grass. And then you go off to Route 1. And Route 1 usually always has normal type Pokemon, maybe a flying type, and then a bug type. Um, however, because in Pokemon Scarlet, the world is literally open to you and you can go in whichever direction you want. It means you can catch all different types of Pokemon really early on in the game, which for me just felt so cool. And yeah, of course there were there were grass types, water types, physics, uh, sorry, not physics types, psychic types, electric types early on to catch within the first couple of hours of playing the game. And what I thought was really clever was there was also like a lot of baby type Pokemon. So there was like Iglypuff and the baby version of Chansey and the baby version of, uh, I think he's called Bonsley, so it's baby version of Sudowoodo, which I also thought just for like the the law of the world makes sense that, okay, close to the starting area, you can start, you can catch these these baby pokemon and then eventually evolve them up if you if you decide to to put add them to your team you can evolve them into the more stronger pokemon quite early on which i really liked because traditionally in, in games you know especially chansey was always like a really hard pokemon to catch like a really rare pokemon to catch it isn't in this game funnily enough um but it was just kind of cool to walk out into the world but, oh my god i can't believe there's whatever the baby version of chansey is called like so early on in the game or maybe even like um yeah, some of the newer Pokemon, just seeing just different types of them so early on in the game, to me just felt really great. So I was really, really happy and that, that really got me invested in catching Pokemon in this game. And I also really liked that when you explore, you might just stumble into a new reason with new Pokemon and catching might catching them might be a challenge because either they're at a higher level than you are or because you don't have many gym badges. And the way that gym badges work in this game is that it, it isn't necessarily about how many gym badges you have um, you have lets you control your own Pokemon in your team better. It's more that the more you have lets you catch wild Pokemon on higher levels easier. So um, yeah, so it, it kind of means that catching Pokemon early on in the game is quite a challenge and um, a quite a, like a strategic battle of like making sure that you have a Pokemon that is, is strong against it, especially if that Pokemon that you're trying to catch is, is a higher level, making sure you have the right Pokeballs, uh, really like gritting your teeth and trying your hardest to catch them, which again is something that I don't think Pokemon has ever really had in the early game. So yeah, it just felt so nice. Like it just got me into the game so quickly, got me invested in the game so quickly. And I think, yeah, the, the kind of, the game has a focus on catching Pokemon and it's shown in, in really how many different Pokemon you can catch. Because I would say out of uh, the 400 Pokemon in the Paldean Pokedex, about 90% of them can actually be caught in the wild. So it doesn't just mean that, okay, most of the Pokemon you're going to be catching is like the first evolution Pokemon and maybe this, and then, I don't know, at the end of the game, you then see the second evolution and then you have to evolve it into the third evolution. It's No, it's, it's really all the different types of evolutions, all the different stages. And again, it, it sort of blew my mind when I realized like, ah, oh, in this game, you can catch all eight of Eevee's evolution, which was always something that... I always thought they were a pain in the ass to do in the other games because the more evolutions they add, the more complex it becomes. And I and I know they've simplified some of them, like in uh, I think the original game, I can't what was it Diamond and Pearl, where they added Leafy on and Icy on. You had to take them to a specific stone and evolve them near that stone. And then um, some of the other ones needed to be evolved at night and and have like a higher friendship or during the day. 
and now a lot of them have been simplified so you can just use uh, evolution stones to evolve them but yeah it was just really cool to like go on the hunt and be like all right i'm gonna go go out and just try and find all of the evolutions of eevee which i, I don't think to catch them has been something you can do in in a pokemon game yet and I think this is really refreshing because uh, you don't have to do so much faffing around with ev evolving Pokemon. Like I just said, it's more or less you can just go out and find them. And don't get me wrong, there is some faffing around to do with evolutions, which we'll talk about a bit later. But it felt so good to be able to just go out and catch most of the Pokemon in the game. It was also like what I usually do when I'm catching them is like I make a mental list of like, okay, I need to evolve this Pokemon later. I need to evolve this one, this one, this one. But in this game, there was a lot of Pokemon that you just didn't need to evolve because you just naturally caught their evolutions, which was really, really cool. And finally, just talking about catching Pokemon in the game. I really like how uh, Game Freak tried to animate the Pokemon so that they, they look like they are exact, uh, actually existing in the world. So, for example, water Pokemon will actually swim and dive uh, under the water. Flying Pokemon fly around. And Pokemon like uh, Floetet, or, or Floet, I should say, kind of just floats around in the wind. And I think this is like a really nice touch to make the world feel a bit more alive and a bit more kind of how you would hope these Pokemon interact with the world. E the only problem is, is yes, maybe at times some of the animations looked a bit janky or maybe run at, run at five frames per second, but it did, definitely did help make Paldea feel alive. And like I was talking about before, the early game with catching Pokemon can be a little bit challenging. And um, yeah, the game actually does have some challenge to it in the early game so you know if you are walking around the area and you see a golden sh uh, shining light in the distance well you wonder what that is well it's a ter terrorized pokemon a sort of regional mini boss that has a higher level than other pokemon in its region and gives you better rewards if you capture or defeat it and these mini bosses add some much needed challenge to the early game which for me is something pokemon has always lacked Again, it's, 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 uh, Pokemon games have always felt the same at the start, which I never really liked. I think since um, since Red and Blue, it's, they've always felt the start. It always feels the same. And it's not the case in this because the game is open. You, the player, can choose where you want to go. And there are these mini bosses in the areas around the start in City, which, again, adds a little bit of challenge. But what I like is, is that there is a lot of flexibility to how much challenge you want. So if you're a newer or younger player, you can kind of stay in the areas that surround the main city, Mezagoza, where the Pokemon levels are quite low. Or if you're an experienced player and want more of a challenge, you can just go off into areas further away from the center of the map and come across Pokemon with much higher level than yours. And I think it's fantastic that the game gives you this flexibility. And it, all, it really reminds me of uh, how games like Fallout distribute dif difficulty. Uh, so, you know, in Fallout games, I think in Fallout 4, it's like the further south you go, the harder things get. So you, you kind of can go south as far as you, you more or less can. And you might be able to be a bit sneaky and, and kill some higher level enemies to get higher level loot early on if you're good at the game. But if you don't want a challenge, you can go, uh, I think it's west towards like the, where the story plot is, where the enemies are actually your level. And I think it's, it's kind of really cool that, that they've sort of done this in Pokemon. Um, and it gives the players an option to choose how difficult they, they want the start of the game be, to be, I should say. Uh, without actually having to add like an easy mode so it's not like they've put in like a all right do you want to play the game on easy medium or hard it's like no if the player wants an easier experience they can stay closer to the the central city if they want a harder experience they can go further away from the city a much earlier uh, stage in the game which is really cool but again there is one very obvious issue with this uh, which is if like me you decide to go off exploring and beat pokemon with a higher level than yours it means your Pokemon will level up quickly. Sounds good, but because the gym leaders Pokemon in the game do not uh, scale with your Pokemon's levels, it means gym battles become very, very easy. And this is kind of like a, a very big question mark for me of like, I, I don't know why they decided to keep gym level, uh, gym level or gym Pokemon levels static. Because I think in all of the gym battles I had in the game, all of my Pokemon had at least 20 levels more than the gym leader's Pokemon. And when I was finishing off, finishing off the last couple of gyms, which I think if you played them in sequence would have been the third and fourth gym in kind of the story, um, I, I played the game for about 40 hours and had Pokemon with, with levels over 70, whereas the gym leaders had Pokemon with levels between 20 and 40. And yeah, I think it's a really strange decision that they decided to lock the gym, level, uh, the gym leader's levels just to a number it would have made way more sense to me that they they had kind of scaled with your level so maybe you know 
they they're kind of there is an average level between your six pokemon and that is the level that the gym leaders are on so that whenever you go there is a little bit of challenge for you and the gym battles don't just become like a foregone conclusion that you know you're going to smash them with one pokemon which is a weird yeah a weird decision but what is not a weird decision is uh Pokemon Scarlet's new revamp Pokedex because it is great. Um, I love that Game Freak kind of added a small layer of gamification to it where you get a small reward for every 10th new entry you catch. Therefore, the more Pokemon you catch, the better and rarer the rewards become. And I thought it was just a really cool way to reward uh, <clears throat> players for catching more Pokemon. And some of the rewards are like unique Pokeballs, which I don't think you can buy anywhere else in the game. And yeah, it's just a very cool way to, to keep the player invested in catching even though i think they did a great job with the distribution of pokemon throughout the world um to make players want to catch them this also just gives you like a little bit of a a little bit of like cheese or a little carrot on the end of the stick if you're doing that anyway if you're catching the pokemon anyway here's a nice little reward for you so i thought that was very very cool in addition i really like the the new presentation of the pokedex because it just looks very very cool uh, so now every pokemon entry sort of looks like a, a book or a magazine on a shelf and if you have caught a Pokemon, you get a nice screenshot of the Pokemon kind of interacting with the world inside the book. And if you haven't caught the Pokemon but have only seen it, you just get like a white piece of paper with the Pokemon's image on it. And again, this is kind of like another like incentive, I think, for you to go out and catch more Pokemon because it really incentivized me to catch them because I wanted to see the nice the nice screenshots. And also the books go from kind of like a, a, brown, a white color to a brownish color when you've actually caught the Pokemon. Um, and I think the, the only downside for the Pokedex uh, in this game is that when you actually look at the habitat of a Pokemon, it shows you the full the full map. And obviously, because the map is very, very big, it, it looks very small on the screen. And it does show you the areas in kind of yellow. But the one thing it doesn't do, and which it, Pokemon games have done since Red and Blue, is it doesn't show you where you are on the map in, in kind of respect to where the Pokemon's habitat is. And I think, yeah, it's a little bit of a, it would have been like a nice quality of life improvement if they just added your face on it somewhere because sometimes you can look at the map and it's so small that you kind of think you're in the right region or the right area where the Pokemon should be, but it's actually quite hard to, to definitely tell. So if you just had your head there and you could see, okay, my head is inside this yellow square where it should be, then that would have been really, really helpful. But that was the only downside I had of the Pokedex. So yeah, so so far we've discussed the world of Paldea and what I next want to tell you is how good Pokemon Scarlet story is. But before I do, let me remind you that if you're enjoying the podcast, please leave us a five star review on Spotify or wherever you are listening. And let's get on with the rest of the show. So yeah, is this the best Pokemon story ever? Well, Pokemon Scarlet's story starts off like any other Pokemon game. You awaken in your bedroom, speak to your mother who tells you that today is your first day at the prestigious Na Naranja Academy. That's always a hard word for me to say. And uh, yeah, this is literally the last time you speak to your mother in the game, as you are soon introduced to Director Clavel, who is the director of the school or the academy, and the Mona, who is kind of like a prefect of the school. Clavel then lets you or gives you your first choice of Pokemon. So you start a Pokemon. The choice is between the water duckling Pokemon Quaxly, the grass cat Pokemon Sprigatito, and the fire croc Pokemon Foicoco. I went with Foicoco because I think his name is the coolest and because I think his design is the best. And after beating the Mona in your first battle, you fall off a cliff and land on a beach with a mysterious Pokemon washed up on the shore. After helping the Pokemon recover by feeding it a sandwich, the Pokemon leads you into a cave of Houndos, uh, which again was like a, a kind of like, a, oh my God, I can't believe this early on in the game, there are Houndos. Like I, I would have been certain it would have been a cave full of Rattatas or or um, Hoot Hoots or Pidgeys, you know, but Houndos are ah, such a cool Pokemon to show off right at the start of the game. And once you beat them, um, you and the mysterious Pokemon meet up with Nimona at a lighthouse where you, do, you are then introduced to Arvin. Arvin is a fellow student at Naranjan Academy and explains that po the Pokemon, Coridon, actually belongs to him and his mother. However, because Arvin and Coridon do not get along, Arvin decides to give you the Pokemon. You then learn that Coridon does not enjoy battling, but will let you ride him. Skip forward a little bit and we are reintroduced to Director Clavel, who tells you your goal at Naranja Academy is to go out into the world with your Foycoco and Coridon and go on a treasure hunt. What the treasure is, is quite vague and it's supposed to be a metaphor, but Clavel and the Mona insist from the very beginning that you can go anywhere and go in any direction you want on this hunt. 
Nimona suggests you take the Victory Road um, by uh, the Victory Road kind of quest by defeating eight gym leaders, the Elite Four, and then eventually the champion, so that you also have a champion status like her. Then and only then can you both have a Pokemon battle where she will not hold back. Soon after, Arvin tries to convince you to help him find the five Herba Mystica. These herbs are part of the ancient history of Paldea and are said to have strange and wondrous healing qualities. The only problem is, each of the five herbs are guarded by a Titan Pokemon, a Pokemon that seems to be gaining huge strength from feeding off of the herbs. And finally, before setting off, Director Clevel tells you about a rebellious group called Team Star, which seems to have corrupted the behavior of some of the students of Naranja Academy. Team Star has set up bases around Paldea and Clavel requests that you look into what makes Team Star's ticks and what their goals are. And these are the three main story quests of Pokemon Scarlet. And as Director Clavel tells you, you are free to do whichever you want at whatever time you want. Or if you don't want to do any of them at all, you're also just free to go off into the world and explore, which is, uh, yeah, very, very cool. And as I've already said multiple times in this podcast, I really loved having this freedom from the very get-go of the game. So let's get into a, a little bit more about what I thought about the quest. And the first one I'm going to talk about is the Victory Road. So this story is the traditional Pokemon story or goal, which we, we have in nearly every Pokemon game, I think, or main, mainline Pokemon game, where you go out and take on eight gym leaders to get eight gym badges to then enter the Pokemon League, challenge the Elite Four, and then eventually challenge the champion and eventually become the champion yourself. In Pokemon Scarlet, uh, this has been tweaked slightly because... They are not, uh, there is no Pokemon champion, or I should say, you don't become the Pokemon champion by beating the champion. You be, you get a champion status, which other people in the world, like Nimona, uh, have. Um, and in addition, there's also been a slight change to how the gyms work. So in previous Pokemon games, it would be that you would go into a gym, solve some kind of puzzle, and as you're solving the puzzle, you will fight against uh, the kind of gym leader's grunts. But what actually happens in this game is there is a now a gym challenge. So uh, this can be things like uh, finding sunflower uh, that have gotten loose in a town, um, using Crydon to knock a giant olive into a basket, or something like returning a wallet to a forgetful gym leader. Um, these tasks are just kind of like mini games before the gym uh, battle actually starts. And listening to them, they sound quite fun. And at the very start, they did feel very novel because for me, it was something new. I think they did something similar to these in Pokemon Sun and Moon, but I never played those games. Um, but however, by the final uh, gym, I was a little bit annoyed about doing them because I just felt like they were a little bit of a waste of time. There was never really any challenge to them or any sort of, oh, I might fail this. It was just like always just like, yeah, these are super easy. Just They just take time up basically before you go on and fight the gym leader, which was a little bit of a shame. And in general, I actually thought this storyline was the least entertaining out of the three. Firstly, I think it's really weird that Nimona has a champion status, even though you absolutely destroy her in battles throughout the entire game. And I also think that the Elite Four in this game were very vanilla and unforgetful. One of them is, is Larry, who is the Medali gym leader. So someone you already beat in the game who just comes back as the third uh, third of the Elite Four. And he's, his character design is he's a Japanese salaryman, so aka just a guy in a black suit and is very, very boring. And even though he's kind of like a, like a likeable, likeable character, I feel like, you know, the Elite Four is usually there. The, the character designs are themed around the type of Pokemon they have. Whereas all of the Elite Four, apart from one who is a child, all of them just felt like person, regular person in regular clothes, which was a little bit of a shame. In addition, I, I also think, yeah, it just felt a bit cheap, the, the, the Pokemon League because you fight them all in the same empty room again not like previous games where you would go from one chamber to the next until eventually you get to the final chamber this was just like you were in one empty white room with a pokemon uh kind of field in the middle um and then you beat one elite four and then the next one walks into the same room and you challenge them and then the next one and then even the champion comes in and again they they this game has some weird like obsession with doing random quizzes but before you can even challenge them you you have there's like a weird quiz section where one of the elite four people ask you about uh, various aspects of the game and about your journey so far and it's kind of like if you if you get some, one of the questions wrong then then it won't let you they won't let you challenge the elite four and then you have to take the quest the the quiz again to make sure you get it right so again just some really weird like kind of pacing pacing issues where I feel like in previous Pokemon games, this is always like the, the, the peak or the pinnacle of these stories. Like, okay, well, I made it here. Like there was some challenge getting here. Like even before getting to the, the, the Pokemon League, 
you don't go through any cave with puzzles or anything. It's just kind of like you just walk up to it and it's just boring. The Pokemon around it are like level 10, whereas in, in other games, I feel like it's like, these. you know, this is where you grind to get good enough to win. So yeah, it was just very, very um, underwhelming, the whole experience. And then when what actually happens is when you beat the champion, you then have one final fight with Nimona in the middle of Meza, Meza, uh, Megazora, uh, which I did think felt quite cool and had like a really nice cutscene. But again, I'd destroyed her in every single fight during the game. So beating her here was like a foregone conclusion. And I really wish that this final fight felt a little bit more like a fight in red in Pokemon Gold and Silver, where you kind of stumble across him and you're like, oh my God, who is this? Like, and then you realize who it is. And then you start fighting him. And as soon as you start, you kind of maybe regret challenging him because he has really, really strong Pokemon. With Nimona, it was just more of the same. She, I think she uses more or less the exact same team she's used throughout the entire game. And they have some higher levels, but it's just an easy battle. So yeah, Victory Road was by far my least favorite of the, the three uh, story quests. My favorite one, I think, is the, the Path of Legends. So this is on the, uh, Arvin's storyline. And at first, Arvin comes across as kind of a shady character who's obviously using you to get to the Herba Mystica for unknown reasons. Um, and uh, fighting the, the Titans that guard the herbs was kind of fun and unique. Um, and I think he's sort of like, uh, it kind of reminded me in Pokemon Go, like gym, gym battles, or also I guess in, in Sword and Shield, these kind of terror raids where there is a giant Pokemon in the middle that you, you have to beat. Um, all of them have two stages, and the Titans designs are either just a regular Pokemon design that has been scaled up to be, be large, like there's one where it's just like a cloif, um, and it's just a big version of it. Or there is somewhere the, the design has been tweaked slightly. So there is, I can't remember the Pokemon's name, it begins with D, but it's meant to be like a dragon. And it, and the Pokemon is actually like a big catfish, but they tweak it slightly to make it look more like a dragon, which feels really cool and makes it feel a lot more epic. Um, the fights in general, I thought were quite straightforward. On the map, it tells you what terror type the Titan has. So you can kind of prepare for the fight by making sure that you have a Pokemon in your party that is strong against it. And then, yeah, there was no trouble fighting them. Um, after defeating the Titan uh, in, a, uh, in a double battle with Arvin, you were then rewarded by Arvin making you a sandwich with the special herb. If you choose to defeat the sandwich to Coridon, it will unlock a new mobility upgrade for him. For example, letting him dash, uh, climb walls, glide and surf. And it took me a little while to realize this, but the Herba Mystica start with HM and all of these abilities are HM abilities, which I think is... is uh, very clever and uh, yeah it's kind of cool that there is almost like an, an RPG element to leveling up Coridon and what is also cool is the more that you find out the more herbs you find the more you kind of find out what Arvin's real motivation for finding them is and it isn't really uh, secretive that or kind of mysterious it is he wants to heal his sick uh, Mazbostif which is his dog and yeah, as a, as a dog owner myself, I immediately could understand and kind of relate to Arvin. I think the actual, the writing here was really, really good, actually. Like it wasn't, it, 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 it didn't feel corny or cheesy. It generally felt like Arvin cared for this dog and made you want to care for this dog as well. And it therefore made me really want to finish the story, this storyline first, which I did. And during it, you are introduced to Professor Sada, who has interest in Coridon and is working in uh, the great crater of Pal uh, Paldea, which is, I think, called Area Zero. And uh, this is kind of foreshadowing a little bit for the end of the game. So that brings us on to the third and final quest of Pokemon Scarlet, which is called Starfall Street. And this final storyline uh, is where you have to investigate Team Star. There are five Team Star bases scattered around Paldea. And when entering them, you have to use your first three Pokemon in your party in Let's Go mode, which is where all of them come out of their, their Pokeballs and can go off and fight Pokemon kind of in their, uh, in their vicinity. And what happens is, yeah, you, you go out and you go into these bases, let them out, and then the Team Star kind of throw their Pokemon out and you have to defeat 30 of them uh, within 10 minutes. And each base is kind of themed on a different Pokemon type. So I think there's a, there's a fairy one, there's a poison one, there's a fighting one, a fire one, and a dark one, I think. Um, so yeah, so you you go out and you um, yeah you use your Pokemon in Let's Go mode to, to battle them. And it was never really an issue to beat 30 of them in 10 minutes. I think the, the, the most it took me was, uh, one took me like two minutes because there were some weird visual glitches. But yeah, it was never, never, ever a challenge. And when you do manage to beat them, what happens is then you are then challenged by the gym leader in like a very cool kind of set piece battle. 
um, uh, which if you win, uh, means you become in charge of the base and the team star grunts there will disperse. Again, because of the, the sort of let go section was very easy, they did feel a little bit like a, a waste of time and they were also very, very buggy and laggy because there were so many Pokemon um, uh, kind of sprites out of their balls. Um, however, I actually thought the story to this was very, very, very good. Um, so the story is that Team Star have become renowned for being a group of bullies within Nanjara. But as you learn, it turns out that the leaders of the group joined because they themselves were being bullied at Nanjara Academy. Uh, it's only after their elusive leader, Cassiopeia, uh, decides to abandon the group, does it lose its way. And part of the story is, is that Cassiopeia, along with Director Cavill, uh, reaches out to you in the hopes that you can rekindle the spirit of Team Star and make them a source of good rather than mischief. So yeah, it was kind of like, a, I, I really like the Team Star leaders designs because they're all designed around the type of Pokemon that they have. And it's kind of nice that, yeah, every time you beat one, you get like a flashback to a year, year and a half before where the five of them uh, are all discussing how they're gonna set up Team Star and what how they are being bullied. And uh, it's kind of like, yeah, like a nice twist on its head because again, I think the, the trope of a Pokemon game is that the team is always a bad, are always bad guys. Whereas in this, they are perceived as bad guys at the very start, but as you learn more about them, you realize, okay, they're, they're kind of misunderstood and they've, they've kind of lost their way, but they're, in their hearts, they're all kind of nice people. And, and in the end, it kind of comes back to that. So yeah, a very again, a very good kind of story and like an actual story within a Pokemon game, which we don't usually get. So yeah, when you manage to finish all three of these quests, you then can kind of go on to, into the end game of, of Pokemon Scarlet. And this is uh, where you and your companions go to Area Zero to help Pre Professor Sada with her experiments there. And Area Zero is a very cool place uh, because it has a lot of high level Pokemon in it and some ancient Pokemon variants which can only be found there. Uh, the story here starts going crazy and is really, really out of left field. It's kind of like, at times I felt like I might playing the same game here. Where did this come from? But without spoiling it too much, uh, it entails you fighting a corrupted AI robot who is trying to bring back ancient Pokemon from the past into the present. Um, and yeah, it's, it's kind of crazy. But the final battle is very, very epic and very typical JRPG final boss. Uh, and it was something that actually I wasn't really expecting from a Pokemon game, uh, but it was something that I really enjoyed because I, I felt like, um, we'll get onto it a bit more, but again, the presentation of this game isn't the best. Like it felt like it feels like a little bit half-assed, whereas this, this bit actually felt really, really good. Like the battles, the, 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 the writing, the animations of the, of the, 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 the AI really, really cool. And, uh, I kind of liked it that this felt like the, the kind of peak of the story because uh, yeah, usually in Pokemon it's it's fighting the Elite Four and doing the Victory Road quest. And in this game, that, that quest was completely flat. So it's nice that this, this section had this kind of like crescendo at the end where everything kind of gets crazy. Then what happens after you beat the the bad the, the bad bad uh, the kind of end end game lets you rechallenge all of the gym leaders again. Uh, they have much stronger Pokemon now, and if you beat them all, it unlocks another tournament you can take part in against some of the strongest game, uh, trainers in the game. Uh, currently, I haven't beaten all eight of them again. Uh, I think I've done like four, um, but yeah, they are, it's kind of nice that you can go and go and fight them again because you can use them to grind some XP out. And if you're kind of evolving Pokemon at the end of the game to fill out your Pokedex, this is quite helpful. But yeah, they're still very easy. I think the Pokemon levels are around 65 and mine are kind of like uh, over 85 now. So yeah, it's it's easy, but it's kind of nice to grind them for XP. Um, so that, yeah, that kind of brings us on to the very final section of the good portion of the podcast. And I can't believe we've nearly been talking about 40, 40, for 40 minutes and only talked about the good stuff. Um, but yeah, the kind of thing that I was also quite surprised about was uh, the online in the game and uh, actually how well it worked. Um, because yeah, you know, Nintendo and Pokemon, their online always seems to have a few loops that you have to jump through or a few hoops that you have to jump through to get it to work. Whereas this just felt like it, it worked how you imagined it should work. So to be honest, I, I only use it for terror raids and surprise trades, uh, but I just liked how easy it was to use. And that, um, it Game Freak lets you team up with random people in terror raids to take down harder Pokemon there. Um, there are kind of like queues where people can be like uh, looking for other trainers to join them to help them take on terror raids, which was cool. Um, and because uh, I don't think in Sword and Shield you could do that. I think in Sword and Shield you, you were only allowed to take them on solo. And then they would add AI bots into it, which they also do in this game. You can take on Terror Raid Solar. But in this game, the AI bots actually seem to 
know what to do. Whereas in, I remember in Sword and Shield, they would have really bad Pokemon and then they would only use like, uh, you know, there would be a training with a Magikarp and they would just use Flail or Splash or whatever the movie's Magikarp has and you'd have no chance. Um, so yeah, I actually just liked how like straightforward it was. I actually did some, some trades as well to try and fill up my Pokedex. Uh, that worked kind of seamlessly. It was really easy to use. So it was quite like a nice surprise that online, you know, it's, it's not like uh, what you would maybe expect on a PlayStation game or an Xbox game, but for a Pokemon Nintendo game, it worked really well. So yeah, I was happy about that. So getting on to some things that I was not so happy about. So this is kind of the bad section where I'm like, okay, this is some, these are things maybe could be improved in, in the next game. And the first and most important one for me was I, I felt like the Gen 9 Pokemon, the new Pokemon were really, really boring. Um, I think it's like the, the biggest letdown for, uh, for me, uh, for the game, apart from when we get onto the ugly section, is the design of the Generation 9 Pokemon. Um, when I start a new Pokemon game, my rule is always that like my starting six Pokemon have to be new Pokemon from the new generation. And honestly, in Pokemon Scarlet, I never man managed to find six Pokemon that I actually liked enough to fill up my team. So what I ended up doing was I uh, I ended up having a team of uh, Skelly Drig, or Skelly Dirge, I think it's pronounced, who is the final evolution of uh, Fuikoko. I had Espafa uh, uh, or Espafra, uh, Daxbun, uh, Quack Quavel, which is the final evolution of Quaxley, and then uh, Meow Scarada, which is the final uh, evolution of Sprigatito or whatever it's called. And my sixth spot throughout the entire game was just always just left open for a Pokemon that I was just trying to evolve for the fun of it. Um, I do think the three starter Pokemon designs are really good. I especially like uh, Skelly Dirge and also like the, the combination of making it a ghost fire type was really cool because it was just not something I was I was really expecting. Uh, and it just makes him really, really memorable compared to a lot of other fire starters, which kind of, the, you know, the joke is that it's always fighting uh, fire, fire, uh, fire starters. Uh, however, outside of the starters, I didn't think there were that many cool Pokemon from Gen 9. I did like Daxbun because I myself have a Dax hunt, so it was kind of like, a, okay, I have to get a Daxbun and call it Trixie because my dog's called Trixie. Trixie. And Esparafa was okay looking. It's kind of like a psychedelic looking uh, ostrich. And it did kind of, because it has like a weird, it has like a, like a blonde bob of a hair, hairstyle. And I was like, yeah, it kind of reminds me of like Lady Gaga back in like the early days, which I thought was quite funny. Um, but I was not, yeah, not really a, a fan of the new Pokemon. And I think the thing that really annoyed me the most was that uh, most of the new Pokemon didn't have uh, three evolutions, but just one or two. Um, and I think the lack of cool new Pokemon is really shown in uh, in the 400 Pokemon that are in the game. Because even the ones from the previous generation, I just think it was just a weird choice of Pokemon. Because some of them just feel very random. And also they added in a lot where it's just a single Pokemon without any evolutions. And it's like, why? Why? Like, I think part of the fun of Pokemon is, is evolving the Pokemon. So why have so many that only have one or two evolutions? And and especially Gen 9, it just it just felt like, yeah, there, was, there wasn't there was that many interesting Pokemon in there. Nevertheless, there, there was like a, a kind of cool tidbits where the redesigns of the Pokemon from the future and the past in Area Zero look really nice. However, you don't really get these until the end of the game. So they are then kind of cool to catch, but you will most not likely not use them in your team anymore. And in addition, I haven't caught all of them yet. I've only caught two so far, but I do really like the look of the four legendary Pokemon. Uh, however, when first kind of seeing them, it may really made me wonder why they are like Chinese themed uh, when the entire game is sort of like Spanish themed. Uh, so yeah, they look really good, cool, but it's just weird that they, they all have Chinese names and are Chinese themed, weird. Um, what I also didn't like about gener uh, this generation's Pokemon was that there are some really annoying methods to evolving them. So three of the Pokemon uh, that you can catch in Gen 9 uh, need to be kind of let out of their poke Pokeball and then walked 1,000 steps without returning to their Pokeball. So you have to walk 1,000 steps in one go before you can then evolve them, which becomes annoying. So you, you have to find like an area where there are no other Pokemon because if the Pokemon is out of its Pokeball it, and it sees another Pokemon, it will go and fight them. And it might be that if they lose the fight, then they get returned to the Pokeball and you have to redo the whole thing again. Uh, which was kind of annoying. Um, and then there is another one which I did kind of, I actually thought it was quite clever, but again, it's, unless you looked at a guide, you would have no idea how you were supposed to evolve it. But to evolve Bisharp into its new evolution, which is called King King Gambit, King Gambit or something like that, 
you need to find a bishop with a special item attached to it. And this bishop only uh, appears when it appears in a cluster of uh, bishops and um, whatever its previous evolution is called. So you and, and it's also in this bamboo forest I talked about before. So you have to catch one of those bishop and then use that bishop against other ones of those bishops. And once you beat three bishop, other bishops with it, it will then evolve into its final form, which is, is, is kind of cool. Like, you know, it's kind of, bishop is meant to be kind of like a samurai Pokemon. And it's, the, the law behind it is that this only a bishop that is like the alpha bishop can evolve. Uh, so it makes sense. But yeah, there's, there, there's no way you would ever have known this in the game without looking up a guide. And it merely makes me wonder who the first person was who actually found this out. And finally, the like kind of worst of these new evolutions is uh, the Pokemon Finizen, which is a dolphin Pokemon. So to evolve it, you have to enter another player's game via the Union Square, which is where you can play co-op with other, pe with other people. And you have to level the Pokemon up to level 38, and then it evolves. But this is not the final form of the Pokemon. To get it to its final form, you need to make sure that Fizian, uh, Finizen learns Flip Term. Then you have to enter all still within someone else's game. Enter a battle, switch out Finners into another Pokemon, then go back to the Pokemon menu. And then in the menu, you should see that it has now changed to its hero form, which is its final form. And yeah, again, kind of this is a cool idea. I think if everyone is playing when the game released, when there's a lot of people playing, a lot of people invested in it, and people are kind of going in and out of each other's games all the time. But two years later, when you're the only person you know playing <laughs> Pokemon Scarlet, this is a pain in the ass to do. And still is one of the Pokemon that I still haven't done yet. So yeah, if you're listening to this and you want to help me out, let me know. Join our Discord and uh, hit me up. Then, as always, uh, Pokemon has to have some kind of gimmick in its new games. And in my opinion, the Terrastal gimmick is by far, far the worst and forgettable in the series. And uh, yeah, this is in single player at least. Because throughout my entire playthrough, I always forgot to ter ter Terrastalize my Pokemon. And the only time I would do it was when the gym leader did it. Because then I just you know, was kind of bored. And I actually thought that the animation slash the cutscene of when you uh, throw out the Terra Ball or whatever it's called, I actually thought this was like one of the only bits of polish the game actually had because the animation looked really, really good. Um, so for me, yeah, this this kind of uh, mechanic was completely forgettable, but I can appreciate why people might like it in PvP. If you catch a Pokemon with a different Terra type and then you, you teach it uh, a move of that Terra type and then the person you're playing against doesn't know what Terra type that Pokemon has and it's kind of more of a surprise, that I can really appreciate. But in the single player mode, um, <clears throat> yeah, it just felt completely pointless. Also, something that felt completely pointless to me because I wasn't breeding Pokemon was the sandwich um, and picnicking mechanics. Again, I think I did it twice where I was um, kind of north of the, I can't remember what the lake is called, but there's the area that's kind of like a savanna and there's no poker, poker centers anywhere close to it. So I used it a couple of times there just to heal my Pokemon. But the whole picnicking mechanic, cleaning your Pokemon, making sandwiches, again, completely went over my head. Felt like it just did not add anything to the game. But again, I can appreciate if you are really into breeding or trying to breed shinies that this would work. But for me, I didn't see the point in it. And the kind of the final thing that I think maybe could have been improved on was the kind of social aspect of the game. So when f first seen uh, the announcement of Pokemon Scarlet and Violet, I was quite excited that the game was set in the school. Uh, because I'd hoped that they would borrow some mechanics from Fire Emblem Free Houses since that game took the whole kind of uh school like harry potter school right rivalry or house rivalry and translated it really really well into the fire emblem relationship mechanic in pokemon scarlet it seems they've taken kind of like a fire emblem light approach to this yes you can attend classes and build relationship with teachers but it's not the most interesting part of the game for me there were too many classes and i despise doing the super easy pop quizzes at the mid and end of term like i said this game has a real kind of uh kink for for quizzes for some reason um, doing the history class was the one where I felt it was beneficial because it eventually pins on the map where the four legendary shrines are. But otherwise, I didn't think uh, the classes were really worth doing. Uh, relationships, on the other hand, were a little bit more interesting to find out the backstory, the backstories of the school staff. Uh, I especially liked uh, Miriam the nurse and how she's aspiring to become a teacher. 
Um, however, the rewards for building a relationship did not affect the game in any way, and you just got items from them for completing their stories. And I think it might have been cooler if they uh, gave you some kind of persistent buffs for filling out your relationship with some of the, the faculty. For example, with Miriam, because she's a nurse. Maybe it would have been cool if after you, you max out your relationship with her, potions in the game give you 10%, uh, heal you for 10% more. Or something like that. Like, Or maybe there's one... Um, uh, I don't know, for like helping you improve your catch rate with one of the, the Pokemon, like with the biology teacher, for example. Um, stuff like that. Like it would have been nice if, if there was like actual buffs to your character and to the gameplay throughout for doing it. Then it would have given me a bit more incentive to actually talk to the teachers. So yeah, those were the things that I think um, could be improved maybe for the next game or if they decide to do a Scarlet and Violet 2 because I, I just before recording this, I saw that the, the games have sold something like 25 million units between the two of them. So yeah, popular game um, maybe they'll maybe they'll do like a two let's see um, but things that I think are really ugly about this game and really unforgivable are of course how could they release the game in the state they released it in so the biggest letdown for Pokemon Scarlet is that it would have been a 10 out of 10 game if Game Freak had polished it and got rid of the consistent visual uh, bugs and crashes like I said uh, 40 minutes of this podcast have been talking about how good the game is and the last 10 or 20 minutes are about how bad it is and yeah, if um, this game had been polished and had a bit more time, it would be a 10 out of 10 game. Um, I think the worst of this is kind of shown right at the start of the game, which again, blew my mind that they left this in. With the infamous scene where you enter the classroom and the students are animating at about five frames per second, it completely just blew my mind, like, because I thought, why, why did they leave the animations in? Like, if they, if they can see how bad the, and framey the animations look, why not just make the students sit still? Like, it's just really just, is kind of like, I don't know, it's as if you're play, playing through a game or you have any kind of QA to be like, well, you know, this looks really bad, shouldn't we take this out? Like, just decisions like that. And I think this kind of lack of polish really suggests to me that there was not enough time for this game to be cooked to perfection because, of course, it is Pokemon. So there is, uh, whenever there is this new next gen, uh, it usually comes out in one big wave with the game, the Pokemon cards and the TV show. So there are obviously strict deadlines that it all has to be released at once. But damn, like if they just waited and polished the game for another six months, I think it really would be considered on like the same echelon of Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom as like, this is like a revolutionary leap in Pokemon or in this genre. And and I think for, really for like po Pokemon has been quite like a stagnated series, uh, at least the core games. So I think if they'd really just given this game six more months and just polished and just got it out and just got it to run nicely or, or decently, I think people would look back as like, this is where Pokemon like leveled up to the next, the next kind of chapter of the Pokemon games. And yeah, for me, it's, it's just really frustrating. Maybe you can hear in the tone of my voice and also annoying to actually like this game because of how poorly it runs. It crashes all the time. Some areas like the cities, uh, the city of uh, Kaskarafa run absolutely terribly. And the reason for this is there is a waterfall in the city and that's the only reason. So, uh, you know, they can't get a, a waterfall to run. Again, another decision where I think, why leave the waterfall in then? If, if the game is running at 10 frames a second because you have water and a river running, take take the water and the river out, please. And it's what's more annoying is that this the game, you, you have to fight the gym leader outside in the city. So when you're fighting him, the game crashed on me twice during the, the gym battle, so I had to redo it three times to, to beat him because it just can't handle the Pokemon animations and the, the, the water running. And then there's also like the particle animations of the sand blowing in from the desert, just a complete mess. And yeah, I think even though the world itself is really well designed, um, to, at times it just looks like a PlayStation 2 game. Uh, it just has really flat, like repetitive textures on rocks and cliffs and grass. Uh, has really angular geometry. Again, just kind of feels like it has been blocked out in kind of a prototyping way. And then they were like, okay, we don't have any actual, any time to add more polygons to this. So just leave it, which is really disappointing. And finally, animations can be really weird too. So it's happened. it happens a lot where NPC trainers, uh, once you start a battle, will kind of stare at you with like these dead eyes and this weird, scary kind of clown smile on their face. Um, and yeah, there is nothing more kind of frustrating in the game than the pop in and pop out of Pokemon. So the spawn range of Pokemon is really limited. Um, so it might be that um, you kind of are in a battle and uh, you like this actually happened to me multiple times and also once with a shiny where you're in a battle, you can see a Pokemon in the distance and you're like, I need that Pokemon. 
but you can't get out of the battle. And then by the time the battle uh, ends, the Pokemon might have walked like two feet away from you and then just despawned. And then it's not like you then run over there and then it spawns back in. It's like, no, that's completely despawned again. Now you, you have to just hope that it will respawn again, which is, again, just so annoying. Like, I think it's cool that the, the battles are like this, where in the battles you can enter it and you can move the right joystick to move the camera around. Because I like that it sh you can see what is spawning around you. But then to have it like that, where it's like, okay, you're stuck in a battle, you see a Pokemon you need or a shiny, but you can't get to it. And then when you can get to it, it's despawned. Very, very frustrating. And yeah, in general, I just think it's unbelievable. And then Nintendo product was released like this, you know, because Nintendo is is so well known for its polish and its, its care and love it puts in the game. And it's actually, yeah, it's the reason I never picked up the game it released. And it still really leaves a salty taste in my mouth because Game Freak, they basically got away with it because of how good the gameplay is. Yeah, I don't think they should get away with it. I think people should kind of hold them to it to be like, well, you know, you shouldn't expect us to play a, a, a shit game, a shit, a game that runs really poorly just because the game itself is good. Like it's it's so frustrating. And, it's, and if it was from like an indie developer, then okay, but it's from Game Freak, you know, Pokemon, I think is one of the, 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 the most wealthiest franchises in the world, it's not like they have, uh, they don't have the resources to fix it, it's also, I think this, this traditional thing of, like I said, like, everything being released in one wave, doesn't need to be the case anymore, because I think Pokemon fans are, are quite, like, di like, diverse on what they like like of course for people that like everything and watch everything but there are people like me that only only play the games or people that only watch the tv show and there are people that only collect the cards i don't think it's necessarily a big thing that they all have to be released at once obviously it might be good for the marketing but for the quality of the, the game at least it's it's very very bad so that brings us on to a very important question about pokemon scarlet and that is should you play pokemon scarlet in 2024 well, Pokemon Scarlet is by far the best and worst Pokemon game in the series. What it does well, it does very well, bringing the Pokemon genre in onto a new echelon, but its buggy performance overall made the game a frustrating experience. Without the bugs and crashes, Pokemon Scarlet would be a 10 out of 10. Its step into the open world is exactly what Pokemon fans have wanted, and Game Freak have designed Paldea wonderfully, making you want to look over every peak and under every storm. Having your legendary Pokemon be your mode of transport is a masterstroke, especially after upgrading it through the Herba Mystica storyline. Plus, it was nice to have a legendary uh, from the very beginning of the game, since usually you get them towards the end of the game and then never end up using them for anything. Furthermore, the other two storylines are great, and the freedom you have as a player has not been known to Pokemon fans until this point. So much so that it is hard to imagine Game Freak moving forward with a more linear game again, because it worked so well in Generation 9. Catching Pokemon is fun because there is a wide variety of different Pokemon types from the start of the game and the slight gamification and updated presentation of the Pokedex rewards you for catching them all, which was never the case in previous games. It's so satisfying that I aim to complete the Pokedex for the first time ever in a Pokemon game and after taking a break, we'll be back for the two DLCs. Nevertheless, there are some things Game Freak can work on for the next game. For example, I personally thought the Gen 9 Pokemon designs were lackluster and felt like the designers are running out of ideas. The Terrastal gimmick in the game was completely forgettable and I don't think they really hit what they were going for with the school setting. However, these are all forgivable when compared to the ugly side of the game and its performance. It is terrible and shocking that a game was launched by and has since not been fixed by Game Freak and Nintendo. If you've not played Pokemon Scarlet and Violet, I would say it is worth playing in 2024 because the gameplay is that good, even with its frustrating performance issues. Maybe do not go out and buy the game new, but try and pick it up secondhand somewhere because even though it is great, Game Freak and Nintendo should not be rewarded for releasing a buggy, crashy Pokemon game in 2022. So guys, thank you so much for listening to episode 38 of the Beat Your Backlog podcast. This has been a long one, but I am a very passionate about Pokemon. So would really love to hear your thoughts on the game. I know the game is two years old, um, but yeah, it kind of, I needed those two years to kind of cool down on it to be able to play it. But yeah, I would really, really like to hear what you guys think and yeah, share what your opinions are. So if you're a Spotify listener, you can let me know by commenting on the episode. And if you're listening elsewhere, you can let me know on social media by adding me at SwitchIndieFix on Twitter slash X or BYB uh, underscore podcast on Instagram. Or you can also join our Discord server. So uh, we have a Discord server up and running for the podcast now. Uh, so if you would like to join the Discord and join the conversation there, look for the link in the description. And if you're in the mood to listen to more content about Nintendo, make sure you check out episode 26 of the podcast about The Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess. 
And let me remind you guys that Beat Your Backlog is a new podcast and needs your support. If you enjoyed the episode, please consider subscribing and or following wherever you are listening and leaving us a five-star review because reviews help new people find the podcast. So it would be wonderful if you could leave us one. Thanks so much for listening and we'll see you in the next episode. Bye-bye. Thank you.